anyone and everyone can and does struggle with fear. Let me say that again. Anyone and everyone can and does struggle with fear. How do I know that? Well, here's one reason that I know that. I know that's true because, well, just think with me about the ministry of the prophet Elijah. If you were reading with us this past week in our reading plan, you were reading about Elijah, most of those chapters. When we first meet Elijah, he's speaking authoritatively, isn't he? Prophetically, with power. He's speaking to who? He's speaking to Ahab, the king, the most powerful man in Israel. He's speaking to him boldly about God's word that there would be no rain in the land except by heaven's decree. But in the face of that troubling prophecy, Elijah himself, even though there's a promise of coming tribulation, Elijah himself is what? He's miraculously fed by ravens, by birds, as he's hiding from Ahab by the brook Kareth on the east side of the Jordan River. That's chapter 17, verse 6. What else do we know about Elijah? When God finally directs him to a new place of refuge, he points him to a a widow's home in the town of Zarephath. And when he gets there, he's confronted with what? More scarcity. As she expresses, and you'll see that on the screen, as she expresses it in 1 Kings 17, 12, as Yahweh your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug, and now I am gathering a couple sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. But again, God miraculously provides. As Elijah explains, the divine decree for their provision in 1 Kings 17, 14. Take a look. The jar of flour, he tells this widow, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that Yahweh sends rain upon the earth. Even more stunning than this, when that widow, when her son dies, God restores the boy to life. And he does does so through Elijah's prayer in chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. Yeah, God raises the boy from the dead. This is the first resurrection in the entire Bible right here. First bodily resurrection, 1 Kings chapter 17. And in chapter 18, we are presented with another incredible story of Elijah. Elijah and the prophets of the Canaanite god Baal meet on Mount Carmel. Not only does Elijah confront King Ahab once again, the most powerful man in Israel, not only does he confront him, but this time Elijah also challenges 450 false prophets, he challenges them to a test of divine legitimacy. Baal versus Yahweh. And not surprisingly, since Baal is a fictional character, right? Since Baal is not a real God. Not not surprisingly, Yahweh wins that battle when he unleashes spectacular fire from heaven that not only consumes the wood and the water and the meat of the sacrificial offering, but also consumes the very stones on which the altar is built. That's hot. That's really hot. So think about this again. When Elijah finds himself in dangerous and difficult situations, when he found himself there, many times he was what? Fed by ravens. He was given unlimited baking supplies. He was used to restore life to the dead. And he witnessed an unrivaled display of heavenly fire. But surprisingly, This is what we read in the opening verses of chapter 19. 
Ahab told Jezebel, that's his foreign idolatrous wife, he told Jezebel all that Elijah had done on Mount Carmel, right? And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. That was the fate of the 450 prophets of Baal. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. She didn't have to go, the messenger didn't have to go far because the end of chapter 18 tells us that Elijah is sitting outside the same city at the gate. He's right there at Jezreel. She sends a message to him saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, the dead prophets of Baal, by this time tomorrow. Here it is, verse 3. Then he, Elijah, was afraid. What? What? He was afraid. And he arose and he ran for his life. Anyone and everyone can and does struggle with fear. Anyone. Everyone. Even a prophet of God. Even one who has witnessed the power of God at work for his good over and over again. Struggling with fear. Can you relate to that? Can you relate to that this morning? To struggling with fear and to being a witness of God's power for your good? Let's look together at how the story continues. 1 Kings 19. Look at verses, if you're not there, uh, if you're there, look at verses 9 through 13. If you're not there, jump over to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, We're kind of jumping up a few verses. I'll explain the in-between events in just a moment. But when we get to verse 9 of chapter 19, Elijah, as verse 9 occurs, he finds himself 350 miles to the south of Jezreel. 350 miles south at Mount Horeb, better known as Mount Sinai. This is where he finds himself. This is what God's word tells us beginning in verse 9 about the rest of the story. There he, Elijah, came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altars. They have killed your prophets with a sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, God said, go out and stand on the mount before Yahweh. And behold, Yahweh passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the pieces, broke in pieces the rocks before Yahweh. But Yahweh was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But Yahweh was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But Yahweh was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, let's stop and let's think about this passage, thinking through this passage by focusing on two aspects of this story. Are you ready? Two aspects of this story. Let me put them, we'll put them on the screen for you here. First, let's look at how fear manifested itself in Elijah's life. 
What do we see about how fear manifests itself in Elijah's life from this account? Second, let's look at how God manifested himself in this account. So how fear manifests itself, how God manifested himself. Make sense? Okay. So we saw the first manifestation of Elijah's fear in verse 3 of this chapter. Remember? Remember what I read a few minutes ago? When he heard that Jezebel was going to kill him, the text tells us what? He was afraid. He was afraid and he arose and did what? Dude, man, he's out of there. He took off, right? He is is on the run. Now, if someone in a position of power like that was out to get you or me, <laughs> I would think that many of us would do the exact same thing, right? We would, we would be out of there so fast. Now, I see a second manifestation of fear in the very next verse. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4 of this chapter. After fleeing, where does he flee? He flees to the southernmost city in Israel, Beersheba, right? On the edge of the desert, way to the south, it's the, end of, it's the end of the land of Israel. That's where he goes. And we read then that he himself, leaving his servant behind, went a day's journey into the wilderness. That's the desert. That's called the Negev in the Bible. It goes deep into the Negev. Remember the Sinai Peninsula? Can you picture it on a map, right? With the Red Sea, Gulf of Aqaba, all that stuff right there. He's going into the Negev. He's going down into, towards Sinai. He goes into the wilderness, and he came and he sat down, verse 4, under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. It's enough. Now, Yahweh, take away my life, for I am no better than my fathers, who are in the grave, right? He's no better alive than his fathers are dead in the grave. Elijah's fear here is fueling a kind of despair. It is fueling this hopelessness that we're hearing in Elijah's words in verse 4. So strangely, try to make sense of this. Strangely, the fear that caused him to run in order to save his life is the same fear that now fuels his desire to die. That should scare us, right? That should, or that should at least humble us and cause us to be sober-minded. Because this kind of fear is not to be taken lightly, is it? It's not to be taken lightly, what it does to our souls. The third manifestation of the prophet's fear can be heard in our main text this morning, in our passage, in Elijah's answer to God's question. Look again at verse 10. There's the response that Elijah is giving to God when he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, if you look over that, Elijah's not wrong about the points he raises here in general. He's not wrong in general. But his fear has distorted the picture. How do I know that? How do I know that Elijah's fear has distorted the picture? I know that because I read the chapter before this. In chapter 8, verse 13 there is a short account of Elijah talking to a man named Obadiah who is a servant unfortunately of King Ahab and what does Obadiah tell him yes he tells him how Jezebel has killed so many of Yahweh's prophets but that he did what that he secretly he secreted away right spirited away 100 prophets of Yahweh And he hid them in a cave with provisions that they needed. Elijah knows this. He was just told the last chapter about Obadiah's courageous actions. But knowing this, what does he say? I and only I am left of the prophets of the Lord. What? What What are you talking about? Right? Elijah is not the only one left, but here's the key. He feels like he is. Do you see what fear is doing there in him? 
He feels like he's the only one. Fear. So fear leading to flight, fear leading to despair, fear leading to a distorted take on reality. Can you relate to what Elijah is going through here? Maybe you're afraid and running this morning, whether you want to admit it or not. You you don't need to be moving your feet to be running. You know that, right? You can be running from all sorts of things. God knows. Even if you're telling yourself you're not, God knows. Maybe you, like Elijah, feel hopeless because you've felt afraid for far too long in your life. Maybe your take on reality is being distorted by fear so that you feel things are far, far worse than they actually are. If that's you this morning, if some of that applies to you, and remember, anyone and everyone can and does struggle with fear, If that's you, then think with me about number two, how God manifested himself in this passage. How God manifested himself. Let me point out to you, there are a number of places where we have have to speculate in this chapter. There's some things that we, we don't have real clear answers to. For example, did God, through the angel in verse seven, instruct Elijah to travel to Mount Horeb, or was that Elijah's idea? not completely clear. We don't have any explicit mandate to go. Elijah wanted to die, but then he's off to Mount Horeb. God does ask him twice when he gets gets there, what are you doing here? (laughs) What are you doing here? But one thing that we know about the God of Israel is that there is no question to which he doesn't know the answer. He's He's not asking a question to gather information. He's always asking a question like that for the sake of the one who's asking it. He's asking it for Elijah's sake, somehow. Another aspect of the story that's unclear here, we have to kind of speculate, is whether Elijah actually comes out of the cave when he's instructed to do so. We're not told that he does. In fact, you go to verse 13, he's still in the cave. Right? He's still in the cave. Did he go back into the cave after the supernatural events in verses 11 and 12? It's not clear. It's not clear what's going on exactly here. What is clear when you read this passage is that God is doing something very intentional here in terms of revealing himself to Elijah. That much is clear. If we approach verses 11 and 12 with a which of these things is not like the other, right? That kind of mi- mindset, which of these things is not like the other. When you look at this passage with those, through those lens, lenses, it's clear there is a loud and a quiet here. There is a violent and there is a gentle contrast happening here in terms of God's revelation. Do you see that? First, God's presence, as the text tells us, as he passes by, triggers an incredibly powerful wind, one that's strong enough to do damage to the mountain itself. That's like way beyond hurricane level. That's like triple hurricane level when you're breaking mountains apart with wind. Second, his passing presence results in an earthquake. Finally, there is some kind of manifestation of fire going on here. I don't know, lava coming out of the broken rocks, cracked mountain? Who knows? Now, when it comes to this location, to Mount Horeb, to Mount Sinai, when you hear this, it's not really surprising, is it? It's not really surprising because we read this in Exodus chapter 19, verse 18, Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because Yahweh had descended on it in fire and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. Well, there's two out of three right there. Fire and an earthquake. 
These are manifestations of what theologians call a theophany. A theophany. An appearance of God. In light of what we read here, I think God did send Elijah to Horeb. It's not explicit, but notice in verse 7, if you backtrack a bit, notice how the angel is providing food to Elijah in light of the journey he needs to make. Now, he could have, God could have known that Elijah was intent on making this journey himself, but I think there was some kind of a encouragement to say, hey, I know you want to sit here under this broom tree and, and die, <laughs> but I want you to take a trip. You're going south even further. I think that's what's happening. And I think God is sending Elijah to Horeb because he knew that these powerful manifestations were exactly what Elijah needed to be reminded of in this season, in his season of fear, this season of running, of despair, of distorted vision. So when God says in verse 11, go out and stand on the mount before Yahweh, Elijah needed to relearn that the God whom he served was and remained the God of Sinai, the God of Moses. The God of signs and wonders. The God who brought Egypt to its knees. The God who powerfully sets his people free. A covenant-making God. A holy God. An awesome God. A God who makes all things tremble. That's what Elijah needed to remember. He needed this desperately. And God knew it. Now, did you notice how the writer is very specific? He goes to great lengths here to stress that God was not in the wind. And God was not in the earthquake. God was not in the fire. Why is he clarifying that? Why is he clarifying that point? These were manifestations of God. Absolutely they were. He was passing by, it says there. But he was not in them. Why the clarification? Why the qualification? So that we, the reader, will look for his presence or listen for his presence somewhere else. You see, he's building anticipation. He's calling us as we're reading to say, if he's not there, where is he? If he's not in those things, boy, he, he sure seems to be in those things because those are surefire marks that you're in the presence of a holy God descending on Mount Sinai. If he's not there, where is he? Well, he's there, verse 12, in the sound of a low whisper. You see, if this brings us back to Sinai, it also brings us back to a passage like Exodus 33, taking place on this very mountain. Exodus 33, verse 11, where we're told that, that Moses spoke with God face to face as a man speaks with his friend. That's crazy, isn't it? That's stunning. Amazing. God, Moses spoke with God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And so now, like that, God is communicating with his prophet, his precious prophet, through this low whisper of verse 12, literally in the original Hebrew language. He's communicating through something small and quiet. Small and quiet are the two words there. Small and quiet. As the God of the ravens, as the God of the oil and the flower, as the God of resurrection and fire, he could have chided Elijah here. He could have chided him for his lack of faith. What are you doing here? What's your problem, Elijah? Ooh, you're scared of Jezebel, that woman? What, what, what are you doing here? 
He does not chide him, does he? He does not lash out at Elijah. He doesn't give him a hard time here, does he? He is gracious. He is gentle. Again, the God who manifests himself in a wind that destroys the mountains, in an earthquake shaking all things, in a fire that burns hotter than anything we know of, this God is gentle, gracious. When his servant is afraid, wonderfully, he whispers. He whispers. And with a whisper, he repeats the same question, the earlier question, verse 13. What are you doing here, Elijah? God's not looking for an answer. He wants Elijah to understand the answer. What are you doing here? How should the prophet have answered? Maybe something like, I'm here at the mountain, oh God. I'm here at the mountain of revelation, Yahweh, because you brought me here. Because I forgot. I forgot who you are. I forgot what you've done. I forgot that you have plans, that you have a purpose, that you've made promises that no one and nothing can sabotage. You've brought me here to remind me. You've brought me here to humble me. You've brought me here to renew me. It's not how Elijah responded, though, is it? He simply repeats in verse 14 what he stated in verse 10. He stuck. He stuck. But notice what we learn about him in the opening words of verse 13. Look back there at that text. Verse 13. As God is graciously whispering to Elijah, he, Elijah, slowly emerges from the cave, but we're told that his face is now covered by a cloak, and he only comes to the opening of the cave. You see, he's still what? Still fearful. He's still struggling with fear. Maybe in the right way, a little bit. <laughs> fear of God. Yeah. Yeah, maybe some of that's there to some extent. But he seems stuck. Stuck in and by his fears. But notice this. As he is stuck, right, after everything that's taken place, all that he's seen, all that he's experienced, the faithfulness of God in his life, the power of God at work in his life, and then him booking it, him running, him wanting to die. And now he's here. Maybe he hasn't even come out of the cave. God manifests himself in power to Elijah. He's still in the same place. His heart's still in the same place. His mind's still in the same place. Notice what God does. He's gracious. He doesn't chide Elijah. doesn't give him a hard time. Right? He's gracious because he simply reveals to him in verses 15 through 18 that he is still in control. And that he has a plan. And that plan will come to pass. Brothers and sisters, there's so much more we could talk about here. Lots of interesting details, important details of, of what leads up to this encounter on Mount Sinai, what follows it, what comes after it. But let's stay right here in our main text and let's meditate for a moment on what God has revealed to us about himself. The open word that you have before you this morning is your mount of revelation. This is our mount of revelation. This is it. You're with me up on Horeb. I'm with you on Sinai. This is the mountain of revelation for us this morning. So let's stop. Let's meditate on it. Why do we especially need to hear these words and learn this lesson? 
Because anyone and everyone can and does struggle with fear. I've shared with you one reason this morning why I know that's true. As I share with you about Elijah and his ministry, another reason I know that's true is because I have, I do, and I will continue to struggle with fear. Things that I'm afraid of, that I don't want to face, that I don't want to deal with, right? That I want to run away from. Things I allow to distort my vision, make it seem as things were way worse than they really are. Because from heavens, with, through heaven's eyes, things are glorious. Things are amazing. Even if I'm not feeling that way, there is always, always, always hope. If you can admit that with me, that there are things that you're struggling with right now in terms of fear, things you're afraid of, if you can do that, then there's a powerful, reassuring lesson for us here in this passage, in this story. Let me sum it up like this. We'll put the summary on the screen. To the one full of fears, brothers and sisters, friends, to the one full of fears, God reveals he is both great and gracious. Great and gracious. Let's unpack that. Specifically, that his greatness is greater than our greatest fears. And his grace abundant when we lose sight of that reassuring truth. What does it mean? It means that his greatness is greater than our greatest fears. And his grace abundant when we lose sight of that reassuring truth. Think about this. We should be grateful that God is great and gracious. Amen? We should be grateful for that. Especially as those who struggle with fear. Both of those things we have to cling to and and praise God over. Both of those things. If God was gracious but not great, we may feel comforted at first, but we would ultimately succumb to fear if God was powerless to rescue us. Right? But if similarly, if God was great but not gracious then our struggle with fear may itself, that struggle, may lead to a fear of God's judgment. I'm not doing well enough, right? <laughs> I'm too fearful. Man, I should, I should have faith. Why am I going in fear and not faith? Because I'm a spiritual failure. That's why God's going to get sick of me. He's going to squash me. You see, we need both. He's great and gracious. He's great and he's gracious. Brothers and sisters, when situations outside, on the outside, and feelings inside seem so overwhelming, think of the wind. Think of the earthquake. Think of the fire. God is powerful and he's powerful to save. Amen? He is greater than even your greatest fears. That is our God. He is powerful and powerful to save. But even when you know and embrace, to the best of your understanding, when you know and embrace that biblical truth about God's power, his power to save, even when you know that about his greatness, you may still grapple with fear. I know that. If I remind you of that, you say, amen, I believe that, I think, I know that, but I'm still running for some reason, I'm still despairing. I feel, still feel hopeless. I still believe things are worse than they actually are. Even Elijah struggled like that. Do you see? Even Elijah struggled in that very way. But if that's you, if you're there, then listen, please, for his whisper. This God is still whispering today. He's still whispering. Wasn't the word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us, according to John 1.18, wasn't he like that low whisper? Didn't he come into the world as something small and quiet? Small and quiet. But he too 
was and is both great and gracious. He is great and gracious. The Apostle John experienced this greatness and grace in Revelation chapter 1 when he beheld Jesus Christ in fire and glory and power. He had a vision of Jesus that was great by, in every regard. It was overwhelmingly awe-inspiring. This vision of the risen and exalted Jesus. Listen to John's response to this huge manifestation of Jesus. Then look at the response of Jesus. This is Revelation chapter 1 verses 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. That sounds about right. Almost like Elijah hiding in the cave who comes out with his face covered. I fell at his feet as though dead, but look at these next words. But he laid his right hand on me. There's the whisper through physical contact. He lays his right hand on his servant John, who is fallen on his face, maybe cowering, cowering, cowering and trembling. He laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. Jesus Christ is both great and gracious, isn't he? Awesome. Brothers and sisters, look at this. Friends, as we heard last week, Moses promised a leader to come. He promised a future prophet who would be like him. That is, one who would both speak and lead in light of God's redeeming power. Moses was different from prophets like Elijah who would come later. Prophets like Elijah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the minor prophets, the book of the 12, those guys, they were covenant guard, uh, police. They were kind of covenant police. That's what they did. That was their job. Their job was not to predict the future. That's not what a prophet does. It may be what a prophet does, but it's underneath his main job description, which is covenant enforcer. That's all the prophets were, covenant enforcers. They came along when necessary and said, you're not doing it right. You're going the wrong way, right? No, 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 no. Stop worshiping idols. If you don't, God's going to do this. God's warning you. He loves you. He wants you to repent. Stop doing that. And then sometimes they'd speak into the future of judgment to come or of God's restoration to come. But Moses was different than that. He was both a prophet, for he spoke as a mouthpiece of God, but he also led the people. And we see that as he promised one who would come like him, as we saw last week, that was Jesus. But unlike fearful Elijah, Jesus Christ was and is the perfect prophet. Perfect in every way. Not racked by fear. He is not running away. He is running into the battle for us. That is our prophet who, speak, who has spoken to us. The definitive and final word of God, as Hebrews 1 talks about. In days past, God spoke through in many diverse ways, right? Through different people, he spoke through the prophets. But in this last day, in this final time, he has spoken to us through his son. His son. That's the end. The Muslims declare that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. They're lying. Muhammad was a liar, right? Who contradicted the truth of Jesus Christ, that he was the final message from God. And Elijah and many others, sorry, Muhammad and many others after him tried to say, no, 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 I'm the final. I'm the final word from God. I'm the final message. Thanks be to God that Christ is that final prophet, that final word to us. And what a wonderful week it is, brothers and sisters, to remember that the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus, what it does for us, 
Him dying for us and rising for us, it secures for us the special relationship that you heard about all through these chapters, 1 Kings 17, 18, and 19, a relationship of provision and power from God, of guidance and grace for his beloved servants. That relationship is yours in spades through Jesus Christ. It's yours. You see, though we deserve the fate of Ahab and Jezebel, though we deserve the fate of the 450 prophets of Baal, God whispers to us like Elijah. What is that that I just announced? It's the gospel. That's the good news. Though we deserve the fate of Ahab, Jezebel, and the prophets of Baal, God graciously whispers to us like Elijah. He does that. As Jesus himself, quote unquote, whispered to his disciples, look at the screen here. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Fear not, I am the living one, he told John. And God whispered to Elijah, well, does this mean I can never be afraid? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that whenever you are afraid, listen to the words of Jesus. Go back to the words of Jesus. Speak the words of Jesus to one another. Don't be afraid, says Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you hear that voice this morning? Do you hear his whisper to you this morning? He's asking you to acknowledge your fears even now. Face those. Remember his revelation as we saw him manifest himself here. He is both great and and gracious, and we can know the fullness of both of those through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we experience what Elijah experienced, but even to greater degree. So let's go now to God in quietness. Let's go to God in honesty this morning, and let's go listening for that low whisper. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me?